Retina Rounds, episode number 113. How would you remove this lens? Now this patient has a mature lens that has dislocated to the posterior pole. How would you remove it? Would you use the vitreous cutter? Or maybe you would levitate the lens up to the anterior chamber and remove it through a scleral tunnel. Perhaps your preference is to use a phacofragmentation probe. Well, this case was shared with us by guest surgeon Dr. Ahmad Tohir from Indonesia. So let's see how Dr. Tohir removes this lens. Okay, beginning with the case here, you can see that Dr. Tohir is starting with a core vitrectomy. This patient has not been previously vitrectomized. And that's a really good idea because as you, whatever method you want to use to remove this lens, you want to make sure that there's not any undue traction on the vitreous and the retina during the lens extraction process. So once Dr. Tohir has performed a complete vitrectomy, ideally with some peripheral shaving of the vitreous base, he can then tackle uh, this dislocated lens. Now this is 23 gauge vitrectomy, so a larger gauge instrumentation being used here. And Dr. Tohir is gonna try to engage the lens with the vitreous cutter. You can see that the capsule has been, uh, has been incised with the vitreous cutter and some of that milky cortical material has been removed, but there's a denser uh, nuclear fragment that's still there. And so Dr. Tohir is gonna convert to a phago fragmentation uh, probe. So using a 20 gauge MVR blade, he's gonna make a separate uh, sclerotomy, and through that sclerotomy, he's going to introduce the phaco fragmentation probe. Now, when using the phaco frag, it's a good idea to make that wound just a little bit bigger because there can be heat generated from the probe, and you don't want that heat to potentially uh, burn the, uh, the sclera, making closure more difficult. So now the uh, frag is being used to elevate up this lens, and that's also a really good idea. You wanna make sure that this lens is away from the retina when you're engaging the ultrasound with the frag uh, probe, because the, uh, the ultrasound energy from the frag, if it's too close to the retina, could potentially cause iatrogenic damage to the retina. So you can see again, uh, elevating up that lens, aspirating it first, getting good purchase, lifting that lens up, and Dr. Tohir is using the light pipe almost like a second instrument. You can see that he's using that light pipe to hold the lens in place so that the frag probe can engage and, and cut through that lens. It can also be used almost like a chopper. So you can, as you're aspirating that lens, you can use the light pipe to try to crack or uh, chop this lens into smaller pieces. But this, is, this looks to be like a pretty dense lens and so chopping it may not be uh, the most efficient option here. So as an alternative, you can just use the ultrasound power, the, just engage the ultrasound with the frag and allow that lens to tumble into the frag probe. So you can see here, uh, that's what he's doing now, is engaging the, the, uh, the ultrasound on the frag probe uh, and then allowing that lens to fall in, using the light pipe just to guide it, almost to support the lens so that it doesn't fall back. And this is something that happens very frequently with phaco fragmentation, where the lens just falls to the, the posterior pole. And that does bring up the issue of whether or not something needs to be put on the posterior pole to protect the macula during this process. Now for dense lens material, sometimes those sharp edges can potentially cause damage to the retina. And so some surgeons like to use either a little perfluorocarbon liquid over the posterior pole or even some dispersive viscoelastic just as a cushion or a barrier to prevent that falling lens material from uh, damaging the macula. Now the downside of using that material though is that sometimes the, fr uh, the lens fragments can almost get, st either if, if, if viscoelastic is being used, the fr lens fragments can get stuck uh, in the viscoelastic, or if PFCL is used, sometimes the lens material gets uh, lodged in the uh, interface between the PFCL and the retina. So there are definitely downsides to using something to protect the macula. In this case, uh, Dr. Tohir has opted just to remove the lens material without anything over the macula, just using the, uh, the fragmentation probe. Uh, and you can see here he's uh, having a little bit of difficulty because this lens material is quite dense. The lens keeps falling back to the posterior pole. It doesn't appear to be folding into the, the frag probe very nicely. In some cases, the, the lens material is almost uh, being repelled away from the fragmentation probe, almost like a jackhammering effect. And so remember that you can modulate some of the parameters on the machine to allow for more followability, a better efficiency of lens removal. So if the, if the uh, lens is not, if, the, if you're not able to cut through the lens, the emulsification power is not strong enough, you can obviously increase the power of the emulsification. 
Uh, if the lens is uh, not folding into the, the cutter, you can uh, increase the vacuum. Uh, and if the, if the lens is sort of uh, being repelled away or jackhammered away from the probe, you can use a pulse setting. So that's going to decrease the duty cycle of emulsification. So uh, uh, pulses of ultrasound will be administered, but then there will be brief periods where the uh, probe is just aspirating, and so it's going to help to hold that lens uh, in proper position. Now, Dr. Tohira is being very patient here and doing a great job of removing these residual pieces. It looks like it's largely just nuclear fragments that are here. That cortical material is pretty milky and it looks like all of that's gone away. Now just uh, checking to make sure that there aren't any other fragments. One other important step here is sometimes these little fragments can get stuck in the anterior vitreous and so make sure to uh, depress around peripherally. Just check for any small, uh, small fragments that may still be present because if they're left behind that can result in some chronic postoperative inflammation. Now once the, the fragmentation is done, uh, now Dr. Tohir is going to go ahead and sew uh, this sclerotomy closed. And this is one of the advantages of using um, a separate sclerotomy rather than enlarging the, um, the sclerotomy used for the, uh, the trocar itself uh, because this uh, wound can be um, uh, more completely closed and sealed uh, for the remaining parts of the surgery. Okay, so here's some discussion points for the case. Now, as we mentioned at the beginning of the case, there are a number of options to deal with the dropped lens. If the lens is soft, even if there's a nuclear uh, component to it, if there's nuclear material, you can still use the vitreous cutter. And in cases where I know I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to try to use the vitreous cutter, I like using 23 gauge instrumentation, as Dr. Tohir did in this case, since obviously it's bigger and a bit more efficient than smaller gauge options. Now, if there's just cortical fragments present, certainly smaller gauge instrumentation instrumentation works just fine. Now you saw from this case that the lens nucleus was pretty dense, and while you could try to remove it with a cutter, it certainly wouldn't be the most efficient option. So how about levitation to the anterior chamber? Now this would be, I think, a great option. The lens could be levitated to the anterior chamber using PFCL. Uh, we've shown you how to do that uh, in a prior video. Or you can fill the anterior chamber with a dispersive viscoelastic and then just aspirate the lens right in the middle of the lens and then push the lens up into the anterior chamber. Either way, the lens can be delivered through a scleral tunnel and usually an M6 style wound works well for this. Now the third option chosen by Dr. Tohir was to use the phaco fragmentation handpiece, which also is a great option. However, you do have to keep in mind that the phaco probe is a 20 gauge instrument and the infusion line that you're using is going to be smaller, typically 23 gauge or perhaps even 25 gauge. So you have to be careful with the larger gauge frag handpiece when you're aspirating. Uh, and that you have to make sure that that lens material is completely occluding the mouth of the phaco, uh, the phaco frag handpiece. If you aspirate just BSS, you can easily outstrip the infusion line and you can get scleral infolding. And if that probe is close to the retina, it's very easy to cause iatrogenic retinal damage. Now, a couple of other tips when using uh, the fragmentome, just as Dr. Tohir did, you want to aspirate the lens material and bring it up into the mid vitreous cavity before engaging the phaco emulsification. Again, this is going to help prevent any iatrogenic damage to the retina by the ultrasound energy. Now, second, remember that you have a number of parameters to improve the efficiency of lens removal. Now, if the fragmentome isn't cutting the lens material, then consider increasing the ultrasound energy. If the lens material isn't folding into the frag handpiece, consider increasing your vacuum. And if the lens material has poor followability or is being propelled away from the, uh, the fragmentome, consider using a pulse mode and decreasing the duty cycle. This will give more of an opportunity for the frag handpiece to aspirate the lens material in between periods of emulsification with the ultrasound. And last, since the material can break into smaller fragments, it's possible for those sharp edges to damage the retina. And in these cases, consider protecting the macula with either PFCL or a dispersive viscoelastic agent. But just remember that while these substances can protect the macula, they can also trap lens fragments and make them a little bit more difficult to remove. Now, thanks again, Dr. Tohir, for sharing this case and for giving us an opportunity to review some of the pearls for phaco fragmentation. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.